Share my screen, that might be helpful. John, um, also uh, to remind you, keep the chat open if you can, because um, there may be things that people want to communicate with you. Welcome to the Hirschberg Entrepreneurship Institute's webinar series. Yes, we can. Perspectives and strategies for success in 2021. We will begin the webinar in about five minutes. Thank you for joining us for the Hirschberg Entrepreneurship Institute's webinar series, Yes, We Can. We will be starting, starting the webinar in about three minutes. Thank you for joining us. We will begin the webinar in about one minute. And good afternoon. Welcome to the Hirschberg Entrepreneurship Institute's webinar series, Yes, We Can, Perspectives and Strategies for Success in 2021. And today we're presenting a talk with John Raich from UNFI and being moderated with Gary and Bob, Hirschberg, or Bob Burke. And today we will be, uh, today we'll be utilizing the Q&A and the chat function. And so if you click on the bottom of your screen where there's a Q&A, that window will pop up and you can type your question on the bottom and then hit the send button. And the, and the panelists will see your question. If you want to use the chat, you'll have lots of information posted in there or other information by other, by other uh, people. And you can, but we want to just use that for if you have any technical problems. So we'd like to get to know a little bit about you. So I'm just going to launch a poll here to answer some questions about the nature of your business. If you could just tell us if you're a retailer, a supplier, a broker, or something else. 
And if you are a supplier, what sort of, how is your product produced? We have four questions here. So you can just kind of scroll down and see the next one. If you're a supplier, let us know what type of product your, your company actually sells. And finally, can we just get some sense of how big your company is based on your total sales? Great, keep those answers coming. Thank you so much. If you're just joining us, we're taking a poll on your company and we'd just like to know the nature of your business, what kind of products you have, how you, how you produce them and about how big your company is. We'll take a few more seconds to get some more of your answers. If you just scroll down, you'll see some of the other questions. We do have four questions here for you. Thank you for, for letting us know. Okay, I'm gonna stop the polling now. And here's the results. So it looks like almost all of you are suppliers of some kind. Some of you use co-packers. Some of you work in-house. A lot of you are on the grocery category. And a lot of you are under 1 million in sales. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And now I'm happy to introduce Gary Hirschberg. Thank you, Carleen. Uh, listen, we'll keep these results up for just an extra moment here so you all can see who you've, you're joined by as well as uh, Bob and John. Uh, not really a lot of surprises here. We've got a great crowd today. Uh, over over 200 uh, regist uh, signed on right now and I'm sure more will come. Um, I always think it's fun. This is uh, Squam Lake, New Hampshire, everybody. This is where I'm posted today and there's a beautiful day for kite skiing. Got about a 30 mile an hour wind out here. So, uh, but I'd rather be with you all. So. Um, uh, uh, anyhow, look, it's, uh, it's fabulous to have John and of course uh, Bob back. Let me first say, um, this series is also done in sponsorship in, in uh, cooperation with the New Hope Network. And uh, I hope and trust that you all are aligned uh, with uh, many of their activities. Uh, obviously, um, uh, they're a, a critical uh, gathering place for us, virtual or not, in the industry. And so well, I really appreciate New Hope's support. Um, when we get to the end of the session today, we will also uh, share with you some uh, news on our upcoming series, as well as the um, upcoming Hirschberg Entrepreneurship Institute in May, uh, which New Hope will also be cooperating with and supporting. Um, I just uh, a reminder, I want to just underscore something that Carlene said. Uh, you know, uh, last week we had a wonderful fury of uh, discounts and deals being offered by brands. I, I think I got it started, but uh, please, everyone, use the chat. It's for us. I mean, this whole series is really intended to just help support our community and help help uh, support our businesses as we uh, weather this uh, current, uh, these current conditions, but also over the long haul. And any information you wanna share, any links that you wanna share with your fellow couple hundred attendees, um, please use the chat. But again, if you have questions for John uh, or for Bob and me, uh, please do use the Q&A. So um, let's get right to it. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're joined, I'm joined today by my long-term, uh, long-time colleague, Bob Burke, uh, Carlene almost renamed you there. Actually, at this point, she'd be forgiven for confusing which family uh, we each are in. We're, we uh, have spent so many years together, but I think most folks know Bob has been a um, really critical and uh, uh, loyal advisor and networker and supporter for so many of us in the space. Uh, he's certainly my go-to guy for uh, knowing current trends, uh, and uh, by the way, that reminds me to say that we do have the recordings of the first three sessions that we've always already had, uh, and Bob's is up and live. So if you did miss one of those three, please go ahead. Uh, Carlene just posted Bob's uh, contact. So Bob, thank you for joining us. Um, John Raish is back with us. John um, uh, was a brave man and joined us, I think uh, two weeks into the COVID crisis last uh, March 
our, and we had, I think, 2,000 people on that webinar as we were all trying to figure out who's on first. Um, John, uh, admit, and it, we were doing a, a practice, uh, a, a warm up session for this a couple of days ago. John said that uh, his views about what are going on in the industry have radically changed since even a month ago. So uh, there, there are, I, we're all in for some uh, of the latest uh, breaking insights uh, from John and, and thank you for being here. John is, uh, for those who don't know, worked over 30 years in supplier relations. He's actually done a stint in the broker side um, but more than 25 of those years at, at U, UNFI as either a, a buyer or supplier manager and, and director of purchasing. He's currently, as Carlene said, the senior VP for supplier services. Um, he's also been a natural and organic council member of the Specialty Foods Association and, you know, really plugged in um, at kind of all levels uh, and, and across uh, uh, all segments in our space. So I can't really think of a better uh, person to represent and speak to us about uh, the trends out there. And, and, you know, as you saw, 87, 90% of us uh, here are suppliers. Um, and obviously, um, it, it, as you look at the kind of the trajectory of the first few sessions, we've had a, a huge uh, amount of interest in e a lot of questions about forecasting, a lot of guesswork about, uh, uh, you know, what, 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 what the trends are going to be out there in retail. Well, you're, 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 we're privileged today to hear from somebody who's truly on the front lines. And that's for John, uh, I need to say for better and for worse, uh, not an easy place to be uh, as we suppliers uh, try to conserve cash, manage inventory, and yet at the same time, uh, keep him uh, looking good for uh, his customers, uh, our retail partners up there. So without further ado, uh, John, welcome back and uh, the floor is yours. Gary, thank you for the great intro and everyone on the, on the call. Thanks for being here. Um, I hope I can share with you some information that you can you find useful and will will help you in your in your planning processes. Um, do plan to spend some time talking about demand and how it's shifting and changing, as Gary said, very rapidly. Um, I participate in a very large number of meetings. Um, to sort of gain insights into what's going on with service level, whether that be at the supplier level, whether that be aggregated within my team. Um, had the opportunity to participate in the FMI midwinter conferences uh, the last two weeks. Uh, I know that that is focused more in conventional, but it's, it's a good data point. It's a good reference point. Um, so got to speak with 25 of the largest um, CPG companies in the U.S. get their perspective on demand and again on a weekly basis very very close to what's going on in natural as well. So I want to talk through service level a bit and give you some insights, root causes, what's going on, what's changing, why. Um, jump into consumer trends that we're seeing and uh, part of my deck speaks to you know, what, what do you do with those trends? And, I, and I've spoken um, directly to retailers in those slides, but I think that the information is absolutely appropriate uh, for suppliers to consider as they think about what retailers are going to be expecting in the coming weeks and months. So uh, let me just jump right into the deck now. Colleen, if you can take us there. Great, thank you. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so this, this, is a, uh, this is a graph that shows the service level that UNFI is seeing from our suppliers on the natural portion of our business from a month before the pandemic began. So this is basically from early February, 2020 through the end of last week, okay? And this is our inbound service level from all of our suppliers combined. Just a quick note, these numbers are actually, I think, inflated, meaning that the, the real service level UNFI is seeing is actually lower than this. And let me explain to you why. There's a lot of items that remain paused, okay? So we have a lot of items that there are demand for that UNFI simply can't order. Those are not counted in this graph. 
There's also a good chunk of our suppliers, including some pretty big ones, that are requiring UNFI to order to allocation. Okay, so what does that mean? If UNFI believes that we need a thousand cases of a product each week and our allocation is a hundred, for those suppliers, we can only order a hundred. And if we get a hundred in, it's counted as a perfect service level. Um, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, uh, it's actually a 10% service level to us, but it's recorded as 100. So the, the, the value in this graph is directional, right? What is going on? And to give you that perspective, so COVID begins, service level drops pretty fast, pretty deep, right? And it's been a slow growth out of that, you know, the worst of the worst um, back in early May. Um, this holiday season was, this past holiday season, Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, was especially difficult in natural. And I'm comparing that to conventional. Natural was much more difficult. A lot of critical ingredients and critical products were either very, very constricted or not available at all. Um, so our numbers have been pretty choppy through November and December. And the guidance that we've gotten from suppliers during that time, during November and December, led us to believe that January was going to be just a, a wonderful time of, you know, really rapid recovery, significant recovery. It's not happened. Okay. And further into the deck, I'll talk about that and how recovery dates are changing. Uh, but this gives you a good perspective on where we are and uh, where, where we've come from. And John, sorry, uh, just to clarify, in a norm in a non-COVID year, where would you expect your so average? Right, right, right where the graph begins, Gary, is at 92%. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. So 92% is probably a pretty good average where we were, let's say the 12 months before COVID. This graph shows us at 84 right now in the door. Um, Historically, if I take away the allocations and the paused items, I'm going to guess that we're probably at 74% or somewhere around there. So we, we dropped from about 92 to about 74 right now. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so, you know, I think this kind of an insight is, is pretty important. What are your peers telling us as far as recovery for the most impacted categories. Right now, this is the guidance that we have. So the way to read this graph is, of the most impacted categories, 33% of the suppliers in those most impacted categories are guiding us that they think they're going to recover substantially by the end of February, okay? 21% March, 17% April. Now, the one thing to think about is when a supplier recovery occurs, it takes a while for that to show up at retail, mm -hmm. right? Product's gotta be shipped. It's gotta get to a distribution point. It's gotta be received. We have to take orders. We have to fill those orders, ship the orders. The retailer has to put them on the shelves. So the good news is, 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 is that this graph is showing really significant improvement in the near-term future. That's the good news. Now I'll tell you the bad news. The guidance that we've been getting hasn't really printed, if you will. It hasn't shown up. So what do I mean by that? Just in the month of, of just in the last, let's say two weeks, 41% of the guidance that we've gotten in these impacted, impacted categories has been pushed out further than what it was. Mm. And for the 30 day period from mid December to mid January, 54% of the guidance we had received got pushed out. Okay. So good news is great guidance. Bad news is historically it hasn't held up. Mm. So hoping that it does this time. Next slide, please. All right, now let's talk about what are suppliers telling us 
in, are really driving these, these problems. Um, just a, a quick note, the root causes that we're seeing in natural are quite different than the root causes we're seeing from our conventional suppliers, okay? So raw materials and packaging is the number one issue for natural suppliers. Um, you know, it's limited organic ingredients and I would say, you know, occasional packaging issues. Packaging kind of comes and goes. It's not a huge portion of this. It's really those raw food ingredients um, mainly. Um, in conventional capacity constraints represent about 75% of the root cause, so significantly higher than natural. Um, COVID impacts to workforce are lowest in natural. They're actually the middle bar in conventional, okay? So the middle, middle bar here, um, capacity can't meet demand. Um, this was a little bit deeper than what it appears, okay? It's a, you know one of these maybe head slapper, you know, okay, we do understand that, John. But, but I need to go a little bit deeper here. Okay, because what we're seeing and a, and a critical root cause of recoveries getting pushed out are suppliers' expectations of what consumer demand is going to do in the near and midterm future. And what we're seeing is suppliers are expecting demand to behave in a way that it ends up it hasn't behaved, okay? And that I think is the real reason why many of these dates are getting pushed out. So one of the most critical insights I can give you, Gary alluded to it in the intro. On January 1st, if you asked me when UNFI thought demand would substantially return to pre-COVID, new normal, whatever you wanna call it, I probably would have told you mid 2021, maybe June, maybe July. We're sitting here five or six weeks later and I can tell you that most of what I'm hearing, the expectations from most of our largest suppliers as well as within UNFI, we now believe that the significant jump in demand we've seen since COVID and sustained since COVID is gonna continue through the end of calendar 21, okay? So what this means is if you expected to recover in part because the current demand was going to come down, maybe in a stepped fashion and maybe significantly by the middle of the year, I want you to know that we don't think that's going to happen at this point. Um, I think the vaccine rollout schedule that we all were told in December, we now know it's, it's not happened, right? Uh, and, and we're seeing that consumers are, are based, they're saying, hey, look, you know, we're not going to, you know, be jumping on airplanes and going back to the office five days a week uh, uh, the day after I get a vaccine, right? Consumers are, are communicating probably not gonna act that way, okay? Yeah. So we see um, a much longer uh, sort of tailwind to the, to the higher demand uh, that's been in place for a while. Go to the next slide, please. So I've got a really dense slide here and the next slide. This is just a listing of critically impacted categories in natural and the latest guidance that we've been getting from our suppliers. I'm gonna kind of skip through this because I know that each, each listing here is not gonna be applicable to the majority of folks on, on, the, on, the, on the call. This deck will be available to you after the call. Uh, so please feel free to dive into these, this slide and the next slide more deeply uh, when you have the time. Okay, Carlene, could you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so let's talk about some fun stuff. Um, what's going on? What's going on with shopping trends? And how do we turn these insights into action? Okay, I think that suppliers have 
an incredible opportunity right now. You know, we've gone through such a time of sort of crisis and chaos. And, and folks understandably have been focused on how do I get through today? How do I get through this week? What we've not seen is a lot of thinking, not a lot of sort of step back thinking. How has the world changed? How is it going to be different coming out of COVID? What can I do right now to guide my customer what can I do right now to guide retailers on how best to take advantage of a changed environment? And how can I present myself as a supplier? You know, 87% of the folks on the call are suppliers, 8% are brokers, okay? So I'm gonna, uh, you know, I have a lot of info in here about retailers, but I, I wanna sort of twist it a little bit and, and talk to how suppliers can use this. So the trends. No need to be a rocket science to understand online shopping, right? Fewer and quicker store visits, less selection, comfort foods, right? Those, those, those have seen great gains, right? But, but more deeply, what does this mean? It means that if you own a new brand, if you're trying to get placement right now, it's much harder than what it's traditionally been, okay? The established companies have set innovation aside. There's fewer items on the shelf. Just a quick stat here, surveying our suppliers who have paused products, who have stopped producing certain products in order to be more efficient in getting the most number of cases out their door, right, to, to try to meet this demand. Here's the average number that suppliers saying are not coming back. 40% mm. of the currently paused items, we don't expect to ever return. Mm. Wow. Okay. There's chaos on the shelves right now. All the, all the out of stocks, all the paused items, all the discontinued items, um, the demand blowing out the shelves, the, store, the, the shelves are in chaos, okay? And what we're not seeing is suppliers stepping up right now and saying, how do I use this to my advantage? Obviously, you've got you've to guide retailers intelligently and in their best interest. But the opportunity to guide is there. And from my, from my seat, at least, I'm not seeing a lot of that guidance going on. So I think it's a great opportunity for you. Next slide, please. All right, so now I'm gonna jump into several categories. The goal here is less to give you, you know, the absolute uh, map for, you know, a half a dozen categories on exactly what to do. It's more about getting you to think maybe a little bit differently, getting you to think about, okay, what's the trend? And how do we turn this into a strategy? Okay, so first thing, cleaning and disinfecting focus. I think, you know, probably not a lot of people would argue with this, that consumers are going to use cleaning and disinfecting products differently going forward than they have in the past. Maybe not to the level they're using today, but absolutely higher than the level they were using pre-COVID. Okay, so what does that mean for retail strategy? Okay. It, it means that consumers are gonna be less concerned about scents, right? Does it smell like a lemon? Does it smell like strawberries? And maybe more about how's, how effective is this product, mm -hmm. okay? And we believe that those more effective products that are positioned that way are going to win out on the shelf at the expense of less effective or products that are positioned to be, you know, maybe not speaking to their efficacy, all right? Thinking about if you have a product that's in great demand, what does that mean for where you put it in the store? You can make a category that didn't used to be a destination category into a destination category, right? You should be thinking about that. 
all right? And, you know, who would ever think we'd, we'd be talking about register placements of, uh, you know, cleaners and tissues and things like that, right? Uh, just, just a new world, just new ways to be thinking about, we know what the trend is, we know what's gonna happen. Now we gotta take that next step, sit down with the retailer and say, here's how I'm gonna help you take advantage of where your, where your customer's going. Next slide, please. So remote working, here's another example. Um, you know, all the experts say, hey, you know, there's going to be more work at home. Is it gonna be the level it is today? No. Is it gonna be higher than it was before COVID? Yes, okay. So our, our category management team has taken a really deep dive in this. They've come away believing that breakfast is going to be by far the most impacted meal of the day. They believe that, that there's going to be a significant transition from those, what used to be away from home breakfast occasions, whether that's fast food, whether that's Dunkin' Donuts, uh, whether that's grab and go, is going to transition to breakfast at home and, and, and stay that way, right? So what does that mean? How do you guide a retailer? Well, if you're a supplier in one of these categories, coffee, yogurt, juices, teas, cereals, right? Baked goods. You have an incredible opportunity to get in front of retailers and talk to them about, we know this is happening with the trends. We know what it's going to mean for demand. Now let's talk about what it means for your shelf. Mm -hmm. These products are going up. They've gone up. They're going to remain elevated. Okay. Cereal is a category that a year ago, everybody was talking about the demise of cereal, right? Cereal's done fantastic. And we expect it to continue to do very well. Overlay this with the metric of 40% of currently paused items aren't coming back. And you can begin to put together what's happening on these shelves, right? And the opportunity that you have. Go to the next slide, please. So here's another trend. Fewer stores, the consumers go into fewer stores, right? They want their shopping trips to be smaller and they're coming in with targeted shopping lists. Okay, so what we're seeing is that consumers um, are, are visiting local retailers at the expense of the big box stores, okay? They don't want the exposure, right? Um, but they're picking those local stores they think can fill a good chunk of their needs at one time. So again, if, if you're a supplier, think about value size packs right? Could you make that part of your pitch um, to retailers you normally have? It? Okay. And I know it's not applicable for everybody, but value and private brand is also going to expand. We think it will in this environment, right? I think everybody talks about this, you know, sort of two-pronged economy. Some folks are doing fantastic and some folks are not. We believe that there's a value play um, to be made. Next slide, please. So expansion, e-commerce, online ordering. Again, everybody knows it, right? So that the, you know, the common comment is five years of expected migration has happened in less than a year. The important thing to think about is a lot of consumers that never went in this direction, they've gone, they've, they've created an account, okay? They're familiar with the process and they're comfortable with it. Okay. Now, e-com, we believe, lends itself certainly much more to the center store than to the perimeter, right? So again, these are retail strategies, but as a supplier, think about these. If your product is in a perimeter department, you have a heck of a story to tell to retailers today, right? Now, there are some, there are some negatives or, or headwinds to what's happening with e-commerce. E-commerce lends itself to, I'm going to order products I'm familiar with. Does not lend itself to trial 
and discovery, okay? It lends itself to locking the consumer into where they are right now. So you need to think about that as well, okay? So listed a number of retail strategies here. Uh, obviously some of these don't apply directly to suppliers like you know, marketing of family owned local aspects. Um, just think about what this can mean to you in, in a brick and mortar uh, in, in environment. And uh, think about what it means for e-commerce as well. Unify is, uh, we're spending a lot of time building out our e-commerce um, options. Uh, we are a significant fulfillment house to a number of very large um, companies, third parties out there that, that you know, deal in e-commerce and, and own e-commerce sites. Um, we're, Unify is also building um, what, we, what we're going to call the Unify Marketplace. So we're going to build uh, uh, an environment that brings retailers together with brands and products that Unify doesn't carry. Okay. And Unify is going to bring the parties together and create the platform for this trading to happen. Uh, we're also dramatically building out our e-commerce marketing opportunities. I just throw these in there. Sorry for the commercial, but we are, there's a lot of opportunities for you to take advantage of at Unify and working with your supplier manager, you can understand all of those options. Hey, John, I yep. just got to interrupt for one sec because uh, on this slide, I have a two part question. Your comment about perimeter, um, are you saying, you know, go to retailers, you have a great story, meaning that most, most folks cannot get their, uh, that, that retail is the, be the only way or the best way to get perishable to folks. Is that, is that what you mean by you get a hell of a story? And, and I guess I'll quickly just say the second part, which is, you know, I'm and I'm sure there'll be more questions about this, but when you were showing service levels at the beginning, are, 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 are there um, categories that are poorer in service levels and are, are perishable among them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good questions, Gary. So yes, those perimeter departments are most difficult to deal with in an e-commerce environment. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll also throw in frozen, right? Yeah, frozen, yeah, sure. Frozen, dairy, uh, fresh, very fresh items, very, very difficult for e-commerce to handle well, okay? And traditionally, it's not been handled well. Um, how are those categories doing? Um, in, in general, I'm gonna take frozen out of that, out of that for a second here. Other than frozen, those categories are tending to do much better on average than center store. And, and in terms of your 72% average service levels, uh, our perimeter categories north of that or right, right in there? I, I, would, I would say probably high 80s, low 90s. Okay. Yeah. Whereas frozen, for example, uh, let's just say it's not uncommon for UNFI today to be receiving service levels from important frozen suppliers in the 30% range. Yeah. Unify needs 100 cases and Unify gets 30 cases. Okay. So long lead. So what you're, I'm, I'm just trying to think about the attendees, uh, long lead time folks, that's where the supply issues become problematic. That's where the opportunities would lie if you can up your service levels in terms of endearing yourself to UNFI and, and retailers. Is that And our customers, yes. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. All right, I'm just gonna talk about uh, personal care a little bit. You know, I'm sure folks have heard this as well. Consumers have tried a lot of things when it comes to personal care and, and uh, you know, personal self-care items that, that they haven't, they didn't try before, okay? Um, there's a really big opportunity in this area, especially to help retailers educate, train, and support consumers to use more products at home. So a couple of, couple of links here, 
uh, deep information that Unify has on strategies here. Um, certified cruelty free is a, is a huge attribute for driving significant increases in sales that we see. So just a couple of quick call outs there. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide, please. All right, so best practices, right? What, what can you do? What can you do? Uh, guidance from, from the front lines. I, I will tell you this, um, the suppliers that have had really significant service level challenges, the ones that have performed by far the best are the ones that rationalize the breadth of their line quickly and efficiently. It, it allowed them to be much more productive overall. If you continue to have really serious challenges service level, I would suggest that you think about this first point, okay? It's, it's an absolute clear differentiator for us on suppliers that are doing well versus suppliers that are just really mired in very, very bad service levels, okay? Second one is communication. You know, several slides ago, I talked about all the guidance we're getting and how a lot of it's wrong. That's okay. Obviously, I'd prefer if it was accurate, but frequent communication and being open and honest about what you see right now is extremely welcome by both UNFI and by retailers. Don't hold back, okay? We've seen some suppliers hold back and say, I'm not 100% certain that it's gonna play out this way. Yep, we understand. And, and, and I think that retailers understand as well. I, I hope that, that suppliers have seen that Unify has, has tried to go to great lengths to support you during this difficult period. And we're not about screaming and yelling about service level. We're about talk to us, what's happening, what's going on, what can we do together? How can we change this, okay? Promotional programs. Certainly promos have been dramatically decreased over the last year, everybody knows why. And certainly uh, there's, you know, it makes sense. But I will say this, if you're in a category where recovery is happening and you're getting much stronger and your competition is getting much stronger, what we've also seen is there's a tendency on some folks' part to say, you know, profitability is pretty good here. You know, maybe we'll just, uh, you know, be filling purchase orders at a high level and enjoying, you know, really, really strong margins. I would just caution you, you do not want to be the last one in your category to come back to promo programs, okay? Mm. Retailers are watching. They're watching distributors, and they're watching suppliers. And believe me, um, they're keeping track of what's going on. So if I can give you some guidance there, when it makes sense for you, get back into the promotion game. And I think it will help you on that chaos that's happening on the shelves right now as well. Really think through the paused items, right? You know, the joke in the early days and in, in, the, in, the, in the worst days of, of last May was, hey, retailer, take a walk uh, through your store. Every product that's in really good shape is probably a product you should discontinue, right? <laughs> so be thoughtful about what products you bring back, okay? Shelf placement, planogram integrity, jump on, okay? I also wanna talk about um, the paused items and how to reintroduce products. Let's go to the next page. Okay, so there's been a lot of discussion about, well, you know, what do we do? Uh, a lot of the normal avenues we have to introduce a product are shut down. We can't do sampling in store. Um, you know, think about getting samples or coupons into consumers' homes. Think about working with retailers to make that happen. 
at UNFI, we are working on some options today. I don't have anything to share with you right now, um, but, but we're looking to get into the sampling game in, in, a, in, a, in a strong way, and we might be able to help you uh, when, the, when the time comes. Um, collaborate with retailers, right? Understand what's happening on the shelf. Understand what retailers are looking for that they can't fulfill, right? And align with, you know, put, put, put the wind at your back, right? Present those items that are really gonna help that retailer perform, okay? Um, clearly state functions, key ingredients, attributes that are trending either on your packaging or in your marketing, okay? Think about, again, another point here about value. Value we think is gonna be a major play here coming up in the next several months. If it makes sense for your brand, think about what you can do with regard to developing a value story, okay? When, 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 it, comes with, when it comes to beauty items, you know, there's a lot of influence out, influencers out there. These are things that you can turn on really quickly, okay? And for supplements, education, transparency are the key. Help that retailer navigate the department, help them understand the new trends, help them understand, you know, what's, what's going on. So um, that's the end of my uh, prepared presentation. I'm going to turn it back to Gary and I know we're yeah. going to have a very, very lively Q&A. Yeah, we have a lot of questions and Bob's going to jump in in a second. Let, let me just quickly, though, pose one that I think is on people's minds. And it's all the way back to your service levels point. Um, you know, if, if your major suppliers, and I, and I think I might have pulled this out of you or you might have said this, um, it seems like it's more, the, well, you definitely said it's frozen. Uh, where you're so, uh, you're having more uh, shorts and uh, interruptions and and center of store or longer shelf life, but isn't that an opportunity for new vendors to come in? And how how do you at UNFI see that? I mean, I, I I know that many of the retailers are just simply working on keeping the chaos down, and they're not, you know, you can't very well bring in innovation if the retailers aren't going to carry it. But on the other hand, if, if you're seeing chronic shorts, then why wouldn't that be an opportunity for somebody new? Great question, Gary. And the direct answer, it is. It is, it is a great opportunity. And UNFI is very open. We made a decision in the very early days of COVID that we were going to be very open to what we called alternative suppliers. Okay. And it's a strategy that really paid off mm. for UNFI. So we have developed a pretty strong muscle internally to get with a supplier, get with a new supplier in an impacted category, put together a compelling argument, put it in the hands of our sales team and have our sales team pitch retailers and say, would you prefer a continued empty shelf or would you like to try a new brand? Yeah. Right. And we've had a lot of success and we're very open to it today. And is there a way, and Bob, I'll go to you right after this, but is there a way that a people who are listening in and others can know what those categories are? Well, um, in, in this deck, um, is listed the red dot category. Oh, right, right. Right. Thank you. Thank you. You're so right. That would be a good, good start. Okay, good. Yeah, so I just want to say this for the couple hundred people who are on. Uh, I mean, you want to talk about an opportunity, go for those red dots, right? I mean, let's let's uh, get real here. And John's also saying uh, the more value pack, the more uh, uh, home-oriented, family-oriented. I mean, I think many people know that, but obviously I just want to you know keep our, our focus on success. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, so before I start uh, going through some of the questions uh, that came in from the attendees, you teased us a little bit about a secret program around uh, getting trial and discovery, which is a big challenge for a lot of brands. So mm -hmm. whenever that's ready to be announced, eager to hear. But in the meantime, 
uh, UNFI has a long list of uh, promotional opportunities for suppliers. And I'm wondering of the existing programs now, whether it might be consumer flyer, shipper programs, you know, what else is in the like quiver that suppliers can avail themselves of to help with this problem in a, you know, in a time where there's no in-store demos and other things like that to get discovered? Yeah. You know, what I, what I would suggest is, is maybe looking more at our digital offerings. So we have the ability to um, do anything from a banner ad um, on the portal where our customers go to place their orders um, to uh, what we call a, a UNFI uh, portal takeover, uh, where we feature one brand very materially on every touch point we have for a short period of time. Um, we have deals that can be delivered um, digitally versus in print. The problem with print programs is it's, it's gonna take you 90 days to go from approval to, to in print. Um, with digital, you know, we, we could do probably three or four days, right? That's, that's, that's the difference. So we've got a lot of those digital touch points where we can both deliver deals as well as introduce new brands. We have the ability to allow links, right? So we can introduce a brand and then push that, push those eyeballs over uh, to a special landing page, maybe that a supplier builds, tell the story. Um, you know, there's a lot, a lot of things we can do. Great. So a, a couple of folks have asked about the process of becoming a new supplier to UNFI, right? So in some cases, they might have gotten uh, authorized or approval by retailers that you supply. And so what's that process for connecting with UNFI, um, getting the right uh, SRM, uh, supplier relationship manager, and, and how do they go about doing that? Yeah, I, you know, probably the, the easiest way to do it is to go to unify.com. Uh, we, we, we have a, a supplier, a link for suppliers at the bottom of the page. And if you follow that, you have an opportunity to, to introduce us um, to, your, to your brand. To your product. So take that route. Uh, it is, believe me, it's not a black hole. We look at it, we're on it, um, and we carefully review it. And, uh, we, 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 you know, we, we take this, we take this really seriously. And, and just because I'm sure the question will come up, um, when people do that, uh, is there a, a range of when they might hear a response one way or the other? Or I, you know, I, I, more I, info? I would, I would ask that you give us maybe two weeks. Yeah, okay. Uh, another person asked about uh, seeing freight price increases on products coming out from UNFI to retailers. Any uh, insights on what's driving those increases and are there opportunities for suppliers to work with you to try to you know, mitigate it for your common retail customer? Yeah, great question. So. Uh, is that happening? Yes, that is happening. Why is it happening? Because the freight market is through the roof. That's why. This, this, is, this is not a UNFI phenomenon, right? The cost of transportation right now is through the roof, okay? Um, so we do have to pass along the increases in cost when it comes to freight. We, don't, we, we, we have no choice, okay? Now, with that said, um, we want to do absolutely what's in the best interest of the supplier. We always, always will respect a supplier that says we want to move the freight ourselves. Okay, so if if any supplier is not happy with the freight rate that UNFI assigns to their product, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure most folks on this call understand where freight rates come from. It is. What's the average size of the order? What's the density of the product? Where's it coming from? Where's it going to? How fast do you want it go, to go from point A to point B? Those are all the things that drive freight cost, okay? Um, so if, if UNFI um, comes to any of our suppliers and says, hey, we plan to move the booked freight on this product from X to Y, first and foremost, the supplier always has the opportunity to say, hold on, you know, I think I can do that cheaper myself and we will respect it. Number one. Number two, 
we are more than willing uh, to work out unique situations with suppliers. So let's say, I'm just gonna pick, pick an example out of thin air. Um, UNFI identifies the, the cost of moving a certain product at 20 cents a pound. And the supplier says, uh, that's really gonna mess with my price point. Um, my product can't handle more than 15 cents a pound to be positioned price-wise where it needs to be. Well, um, a couple of options for this, the supplier, you, you can take responsibility for moving the product and charge UNFI 15 cents a pound and that's what we'll reflect. You could also say to us, look, I don't have the ability to manage the freight, to negotiate with a carrier, uh, to handle claims and to do all those other things, all those wonderful things related to freight. You can come to us and say, look, UNFI, we're gonna give you a, a five cent per pound freight allowance. So we understand the cost is 20. We only want you to reflect 15 in the cost basis of the product. And we'll, we'll grant you a, a five cent per pound pickup allowance um, to, to bridge that gap. So uh, we'll try to offer as many options as we can. That's great. And, and on the, um, while we're on the topic of freight, a question came in about uh, to what degree has transportation issues affected those fill rates you referred to earlier? And um, specifically this supplier is seeing examples of uh, UNFI having appointments with their co-packer or somewhere else to pick up, missing those appointments, uh, maybe because uh, stress throughout the system leading to uh, out of stocks and spoilage. Um, what can they do on their end to help uh, work with you to fix those problems? Or do you have an idea of uh, how pervasive that might be? Yeah, um, yeah, we, we certainly have had some challenges and whether that's a UNFI truck, um, think about the stresses UNFI is under. This isn't an excuse, it's just reality. Think about the stresses we're under in, in managing our business. Uh, a lot of our suppliers have been impacted by, by COVID, uh, you know, from time to time, sometimes seriously. Uh, UNFI is not immune to those situations either, right? So we're, we're doing the best we can. And sometimes the third party carriers that UNFI utilizes haven't shown up, haven't made pickups that, that we expected them to. Um, in response, um, we did a few things. Um, UNFI traditionally enters into long-term contracts with our freight carriers, okay? Um, given our size, um, given our commitment to a long-term agreement with a, with a carrier, we tend to get, get you know, better rates maybe than, than the average uh, consumer of freight. The downside is those wonderful rates turn against you when there's very little capacity in the market. Mm. We've had some of those carriers say to us, we don't really care that we have a contract with you. We could either fulfill that contract or we could get twice as much money from this guy who just approached us that doesn't have a contract, right? So we've had to deal with some of that, mm. okay? Now, um, the good news is that the freight market, the resource availability is, is much better today than it was 60 days ago. Okay. Has it, in fact, has it affected service level? Yes, it has. Has it affected our performance on pickups? Yes, it has. It is, it is getting better. Um, we have moved uh, those long-term contracts, some of those long-term contracts to contracts that are very short-term in nature, meaning we're, we're telling our carriers we're willing to pay a lot more for much better service, which what does that mean? We have to change the freight we have booked, right? So all this stuff is connected. Got it. You know, uh, can I just jump in, yeah. uh, just piggyback. Uh, one uh, guy who represents a well-known perishable coconut water brand that you would know uh, is he said uh, he's seeing, and perhaps this is going on with others, uh, UNFI setting appointments at Copacker and then missing those appointments and then you know, they're not able to play catch up. And is there a suggestion for addressing it? I mean, I do want to say quickly, uh, others, uh, Rob Wag and others have, have, have absolutely backed you up on the 
the meetings every two weeks with the SRMs and the buyers to review inventory. But this is a, you know, a logistics challenge. Uh, I just wonder yeah. what your coaching yeah. comment is. Gary, number one, we take it very, very seriously. Yeah. Believe me, this is a very serious issue for us. We're doing the best we can. We've taken every step we believe we can take to get better here. If there's a certain situation, uh, you know, that, 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 you know, is, 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 is wreaking havoc for a supplier, please reach out to your supplier manager. Let's have the discussion. Um, I have acted as an intermediary personally mm -hmm. with, with our VP over our, our inbound transportation in many, many situations. Some of those situations have ended up in UNFI saying, we don't think we can solve this particular issue in the near term future. Mm -hmm. So supplier, we, we would strongly urge you to to, to manage that freight yourself. Now that's we that's not our default and we don't want to go there, but sometimes that happens. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Hey, um, back in the last Expo West of 2019, it was jokingly referred to as the CBD show. Uh, here we are, you know, February of 21. What's UNFI's stance on CBD? Yeah, how times have changed, huh? Well, I haven't heard that acronym much in 2020. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, you know, you, UNFI- oh, are dependent on it, so. <laughs> you know, UNFI is in a position where we need to follow conservative US government federal guidance. Let me say that. We, you know, we know it's a crazy environment. Uh, we don't like it that, you know, states are creating all these rules and laws that are, that go against sometimes federal law uh, that certainly can be different than the next state over, okay? Just understand this, UNFI is a very large player in the movement of product interstate, mm -hmm. okay? So while we've made exceptions where we can't, Colorado is a state that probably has, you know, I would say one of the more lax environments. We basically, we're trying our best to take advantage of those opportunities. Now, Colorado said, if the product is grown, packaged, uh, all the ingredients and all the packaging comes from Colorado, it's legal in the state of Colorado. Luckily, we have a distribution center in Colorado. So if we can find a supplier that fulfills all the demands of Colorado's law, okay, and we can maintain that product within the barrier, within the, the, the constraints of Colorado, Gary, we're open to doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but, but uh, um, you know, we, we just need to be cautious as a very large mover of interstate commerce. Yeah. Another question is about uh, establishing optimum uh, case packs for especially early stage emerging brands, meaning, you know, should they be leaning towards case packs of six or 12, or does it, you know, vary widely by category? Yeah, there's, there's certainly no one answer there. Um, you know, I, you know, some of probably the bigger, uh, things I would take into consideration, how expensive is the product? What is the average velocity for a retailer, right? How, how big is it? Um, how effective do you think you can be at gaining multiple facings on the shelf, right? And you need to be honest with yourself. If you say, I've got an expensive product that in a good retail situation is going to move three units a week, um, you probably shouldn't be thinking about a 12 count case, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, historically, it's uh, been tied to velocity, right, for that category mm -hmm. or for the brand. And I'll just add that for those uh, folks who are involved with the Specialty Food Association, the people who put on the uh, fancy food show, they've done a lot of uh, formal studies on that, and it's on their uh, website at uh, specialtyfood.com. Um, can you comment at all on what growth you're seeing in, say, nutritional supplements? Um, functional foods, uh, vitamins, minerals, et cetera? 
Um, let, let me answer the question maybe a little bit differently, but I think in the spirit of, of addressing it. Um, we have seen some of our larger retailers significantly de-emphasize non-foods in this environment, supplements and personal care specifically. Um, you know, clearly personal care items, there's been some growth because of this, you know, consumers can't go to get their hair colored or, or whatever, right? We, we all understand those things. But what we've seen is retailers come to us and say, we have stopped all promoting in these categories, yeah. right? That's not uncommon, mm -hmm. okay? When push comes to shove, okay, uh, I'm not gonna use any names here, but we had a retailer that had issues with their ordering system that caused a, a, lot, of, a lot of trouble, right? And, and it forced that retailer to prioritize recovery. That retailer said to us, take personal care and supplements off the orders. Okay. So that's what I'm, what I'm seeing. That's, that's what I'm experiencing right now. But, you know, again, if, if you've got personal care or supplement item that is absolutely on trend, you should be out there beating the drum and explaining to the retailer why you're different and why you want different treatment. Yeah. Yeah. Just a, a, on a sort of a, Hopeful note, it's interesting. Uh, Dean Nelson is on today from uh, Dean's mm. and um, is commenting that uh, UNFI has been really proactive in assisting them find comparable items to keep their shelves full and that they've, they've literally tasked you guys with scanning the shelves for long-term out of, out of stocks and requested that you find uh, replacements. So that's an example, a live example here. Of that's, a great. that's great, that's great. But I, I, I also wanna highlight that for the the, the suppliers online here. I mean, you know, um, if you're in the stores and you're seeing these gaps, uh, you know, don't be mute now. This is not the time for silence. You've, you've had the, the head of supplier relations here uh, tell us that uh, their number one problem, the way he began is service levels. It, and so this, if you are a solution, um, here we're hearing from a retailer who's partnered with uh, John and, and company. So this is a, you know, a place to zero right in. And then I certainly agree, because there's a, I agree with the six, your answer on the six pack versus 12. You know, there's a bundle of questions sort of all related to getting started, you know, mm -hmm. how to get started right now. Uh, you know, can a company be set up as a vendor before attaining a retail partner? And then, and then there's a retail, someone who's got the retailer, but needs needs a, a supply manager to contact you can look at the q a also but i i'm just in the in the chaos as uh, to use your word and we're all, certainly all seeing it uh are there are there you know pointers for some of these early stage brands who maybe have a um have a you know a a, 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 a get, they're seeing a gap in the market i mean how do, how do they get your how do they get somebody's attention at unfi uh, great, great question. Um, you know, let, let me first answer the, do, do I need to have retail support before I come to you, UNFI? The answer there today is no. No, you don't. We're willing to consider a completely new product. And that's, that's different than where we normally are. Yeah, that's but that's the environment today. Mm. Um, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you make it work? How do you get established? Have, have a good pitch, right? Why, right? You have that elevator pitch ready. Why is your brand that's not in stores, right? Not in our retailers. Why is it good? Why is it good for you and if I, why is it good for the retailers we service? And the answer may be, hey, look, I got a quality product that this category is, is in bad shape service level wise, and, and these are sales to be had. The, the consumer is gonna be better served with my product on the shelf versus nobody's product mm -hmm. on the shelf, right? Now, 
you know, there, there's a responsibility as well with the supplier. We're going to look for your help as well. What are you going to do, right? How are you going to help us pull this product through, right? So the, the more you can answer that question, uh, and obviously, maybe goes without, maybe I shouldn't say goes without saying, you come and say, hey, not only do I have a product in a category that's been really negatively affected service level wise, but I can tell you, I can produce X amount per week or per month. Those are the kind of insights that are incredibly important to us right now. Yeah. That's great. Um, you know, maybe while you're at it, John, you can say a few words about UNFI next. Yeah. So, um, we, we, we have a, a dedicated team within supplier management. Uh, it's called Up Next. And, and this team is 100% focused on holding the hands of emerging disruptive brands, brands that bring something new and different to the market. And it's a, it's a whole different level of support and engagement. The quote on, you know, the air quotes, standard rules of the road for suppliers at UNFI, in many cases are paused for up next suppliers. There's much more lax rules, there's fewer expenses, and there's a dramatically elevated level of support where the average supplier manager might have 180 suppliers on their desk. The average up next supplier manager may have 40. Okay, that's the difference. So um, the team has been in place for a long time. We've got folks that are extremely knowledgeable and this is all they do. This is all they do. So the unique challenges of an emerging brand are exactly what this team is plugged into. Okay. That's great. Um, one of the uh, listeners attendees asked about, can you elaborate a little uh, bit more on what you meant by having a value story? In other words, is it um, more around frequent promotions? Is it thinking about case packs and sizes and things like that? Or, or are there other things as well? Yeah, certainly you, you can build a value story in different ways. Um, a promotional uh, plan is, is one, right? That's probably the easiest one to execute quickly because you don't really have to change anything other than your promotional calendar. Another option is, is to look at your, your packaging and say, should I offer a larger size, right? Um, also may want to think about, um, do I have the ability to create a slightly different product that's less expensive, right? That fills a, a need that's not being met um, in, in, in that category. So there's a lot of ways to go about it. I would define value as, um, the consumer that's looking at your product on the shelf, are they going to pick it up because cost versus results is, is better than the average product in, in your, in your category, right? Got it. One, you know, one, uh, I, I, oh, go I ahead, know oh, sorry, Gary. I was going to say, I know it varies by category, but some folks are asking what might be ranges of hurdle rates uh, in a DC, right? So, you know, you want to make sure you're on solid footing before you expand too quickly or go into other DCs, but can yeah. you give some guidance on that? And, and by the way, this particular questioner is a new entry in frozen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Frozen desserts. Yeah. So this is the age old question, right? What's the magic number? I'm really sorry to tell you there isn't a magic number, right? Every distribution center and every area within the distribution center sort of has its own rules. What do I mean by that? Well, the hurdle rate for a frozen product, whether you want to talk about dollars or cases, is going to be dramatically higher than the hurdle rate for uh, a repack item, right? Uh, a supplement or a personal care item that takes virtually no space and does not need any temperature control, right? So it really varies. Um, Frozen's the toughest, um, you know, chill, dairy is, is the second toughest. The reason why is you are absolutely constricted. You have got four walls and outside of those four walls, 
you don't have temperature control, <laughs> right? So not much of a discussion there. I got it here. You can ship yeah. here. Yeah, you got reefer trucks, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you how good it works selecting from a reefer truck. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you want to talk about spoils. Yeah, we can go there. Uh, okay. So it, it, it varies. Uh, you know, rules of thumb, you know, if, if you're a center store, you know, I would say 10, 10 cases a week in a distribution center, you may be in good shape. That same distribution center, frozen might be 20, right? Personal care might be a case, right? So it's, it, 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 it really varies and it can vary by DC and it can also vary over time, right? Everything points to, you know, how, you know, where is that DC operating on, on, on its ability, right? Is, is it 90% full? Is it 101% full? Is it 82% full, right? In these various um, areas within that distribution center. So there's a lot of factors that go into it. Great. Hey, um, there's a couple of, uh, this is now testing your, how current you really are, John. A couple of C Canadian questions. Um, <laughs> Can you comment on whether there's unique insights for Canadian suppliers to unify Canada? You know, are these observations and data that you've shared consistent up there? And a related, well, another Canada question is, uh, uh, can, how can a brand get involved with well.ca? I've heard that Unify Canada partners with them. So I'm gonna apologize up front that I am not the Canada expert. Right, I, um, I was giving you that out. <laughs> I, 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 I know enough to know that I don't know. Okay. okay. That is a completely different market than the U S uh, you know, as far as retailers and exclusivity and promotions and, 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 and everything else. So I'm going to need to pass on that one, unfortunately. Okay. Um, but, but Gary, if, if, if you got a few folks that, you know, have really specific, uh, Canada questions, um, you know, I'm happy to, to forward them to the right folks. Okay, that's great. One of your up next buyers uh, recently told us we have to be in 20 to 25 stores to be considered. What's the reality? That is the question. Well, I, I, I will say this, that is not a hard and fast rule for all up next suppliers. I, I don't know what that particular situation is. I don't know why the supplier manager made that comment, but I can tell you that that is not um, a, a, you know, quote unquote standard hurdle rate or anything. Okay, like that. good. Hey, John, this is uh, this is a good question that comes up a lot uh, when I talk to companies um, when they're trying to understand what their likely retail price landing on the shelf is. What should they estimate? Is there a rule of thumb on UNFI's margin? Mm. In other words, I know that you know based on their landed cost into your DC, you have a margin that you reflect in like the uh, wholesale uh, price that's in the catalog that mm. MCBs and free fills and stuff are based on. But mm. then you know you have a wide variety of cus uh, customers, all with different contract pricing and et cetera. So when they're doing their sort of um, value chain or laddering up to a retail price, you know, is there a range or a rule of thumb they should be using? Yeah. Look, it's, it's, a, it's a very fair question and, and uh, it presents uh, pretty straightforward. Um, the answer might take me between one and two days to give to you <laughs> right in detail. Um, here, here's the deal. Yes, Unify has um, standard uh, markups or margins by category, that is true. I will also tell you, uh, you know, my, my typical talk point is that our catalog price, our catalog is a work of fiction, okay? Nobody pays catalog price, okay? Do many retailers use catalog price to select a retail price? The answer is yes. So what I'm telling you is, that the answer is really divorced from UNFI margin, okay? The, the decision rests with the retailer and not with UNFI. But if you're looking for a general rule of thumb, if the product is landed at UNFI for a dollar, okay? 
So that's your price list. That's the supplier price list plus the freight to get it to our door. If the combination of those two pieces are a dollar, uh, you should probably expect the retail price on the shelf to be $2. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Well, that's easy to remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, before everybody freaks out and says, my God, Unify makes 100% margin. If you'd like to take a look at any of our earnings releases <laughs> or public financial information, you will find that our margins are very deep into the single digits, okay? Not the triple digits, okay? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we get it. That's good. Um, and go ahead, Gary. Well, I, this question came up early and I just don't want to miss it. Uh, and maybe we talked about it, but for new suppliers, can UNFI supply velocities by category so they can do better projections on movement? It, I think we kind of covered it, but. Yeah, um, there's, there's a tremendous number of uh, data uh, insights that UNFI shares. And we have been very careful um, to, uh, you know, there, there are some that, that are free, there are some that come at a cost. Those that come at a cost, the cost is very thoughtful about new suppliers. It tends to be a very small percentage of UNFI's um, purchase amount to the supplier. So it is ve very much tailored to be extremely accessible. Um, I have also over the years been very willing uh, to give uh, new suppliers in, in, to UNFI, you know, uh, exceptions, uh, running unique reports or providing them one-time uh, insights to, to help them out. So we'll do what we can uh, to support those emerging suppliers, absolutely. Thanks. Right. Well, here's an interesting question. Um, uh, what are your thoughts regarding categories that are international? Specialty in particular, as obviously the specialty food show has been canceled a couple of times. Are there any, are there particular countries that are on trend? Uh, she's reading that West Africa is a world region that's a, a hot trend. I saw a, a Fanyi uh, display this morning at a big natural yeah. store, actually. Well, Tevera. Yeah. Any comments on that, John? Gosh, the, the, the one thing that comes to mind immediately, the trend I'm thinking about is right now, there are 37 container ships off the coast of California waiting to get into LA and Long Beach, carrying an estimated 336,000 20 foot containers. Wow. Okay, so the biggest thing we're seeing with our specialty import business <laughs> is incredible delays mm -hmm. in securing the product mm -hmm. and resultant really poor service levels. Yeah. That's the story of imported specialty right now. New York, New Jersey, California, just an incredibly difficult environment right now for imports. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so given what your opening slides, then it's an area obviously that you guys are gonna be very ginger about. Mm -hmm. People, that's good good insight. People need to know that. What else, Bob, we got? Yeah, there's a, a question about um, any, uh, you made reference to some of the initiatives you're doing around e-commerce. Um, oh, yeah. Are there e-commerce options for chilled products? Um, yes, but, um, the e-commerce option is going to be if, if, if you're a chilled supplier and you would like to take advantage of Unify marketplace and to ship that product directly to the retailer, um, or, or, or the consumer, um, then, then we're going to be able to facilitate that, but we do not have the infrastructure to support, um, just standard shipping. Uh, of you know ecom one off boxes uh, in temperature control right now got it let's see covering a lot of areas some are getting super specific well okay somebody's uh i think this is a veiled um well we'll just i'll just read it if no one is using catalog price you said it's a fiction why does you and if i use a catalog price for chargebacks yeah <laughs> yeah, boy, didn't see that one coming. No, you know, so. look, I'll tell you this. Every, everything is, is a balancing act, okay? UNFI makes 
a small margin. And that small margin is comprised of things that we do uh, that gets suppliers product into retailers hands, perhaps below UNIFI's cost. And there are things that we do where you can say, well, my God, why are you doing your calculation that way? And, and, and I'll, end, I'll end the response by saying this, any program that does something like that is an optional program. UNIFI does not require anyone to use those programs. So we, we offer a service, we do set the price. I understand some folks might not be happy with that price. It's 100% within your control, whether you choose that program or not. Yeah. And a related uh, question, uh, kind of dovetailing from your an earlier answer was uh, how, since the margins do vary by the category, this person's asking how they can know the expected margins by category. And I assume your answer is the SRMs. Absolutely. The supplier manager can answer your question very specifically. Yeah. E even if it's even if it's a, a what if, right? Hey, I'm thinking about potentially creating a new product, right? I believe UNIFI that our price list on this product would be X. Um, here's the case pack, the weight, uh, the cube. Um, UNIFI, tell me what the SRP will be. We can mm -hmm. do that. Yeah. We can do that. Now we'll give you an estimate, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not gonna go out and find and hire a carrier and agree on an exact rate, but we can get pretty close. Yes, yeah. Hey John, you, you touched earlier on some trends and attributes and things like that. Uh, one, one person's asking about uh, what are some of the uh, attributes that brand managers might be looking for uh, they mentioned uh, bioengineered, which might be cellular protein, you know, uh, meat production. But I'm also wondering about things like keto and paleo and other sort of diet trends that have been either faddish or trends and, you know, whether they're likely to persist. Yeah, uh, keto remains um, quite strong. Um, you know, it's, it's hard for me to answer this, this question well, yeah. um, but you know, we, we would certainly be willing to share with any supplier specific to a category. Here are the trending attributes that we see. Um, we, we would certainly be willing to have that kind of a discussion. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 we're getting near the end and I, I, I sort of want to feed this, ask you to comment on this because it, it's, it's, it's a paraphrase of a, a question. Somebody's asking, um, you know, can they get into selected specific geographic areas for UNFI? You, you know, you made the Colorado point earlier with CBD, um, but I, I, you know, I, th I think, I think, you know, uh, as we sort of move towards the end here, you know, uh, guidance pointers. I mean, what, 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 what I'm hearing you're saying again and again and again here is is look, there's gaps. And I and of course, this was the theme last March, right? In the hot heat of this thing, when things were, as you showed that things really went off the cliff. But, uh, you know, essentially what I'm hearing you say is you're, you're looking for solutions. And if a solution is, you know, available, if a supplier can do a great thing in a, in a geography, that's a solution. They might not be able to go national. And you're, you're encouraging people to bring those forward to you, right? I mean, that's, I'm, that's yeah. sort of what I'm hearing you saying to, to folks. Yeah. So all these all, of all of our systems support um, what could be a, a single distribution center listing for a product. Yeah, we 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 can do that easily. Yeah, easily. And if that's a solution for for a geography, one geography, we're absolutely going to take a look at. It. Yeah, absolutely. and I should I should say you know all the way back to the very beginning of your comments, uh, Bob and I are both associated with a couple of early brands who who know that they've got supply issues, and so they are intentionally launching, as many are, particularly with freight uncertainties, uh, in in defined geographies. And frankly, in mm -hmm. both cases, uh, UNFI has been great. As a matter of fact, there was a comment here that. Uh, there's an, one of these new entrants is an up next supplier and that, that team's been great, a huge asset for a new, new entrant. 
Um, yeah. Speaking of freight, uh, I'm just looking quickly for the last couple of questions. Uh, what safety factor should people use in current freight cost budgets for the remainder of 2021? Like a 25%? Uh, what, what are your coaching people? Okay, so I'm going to answer the question with the caveat that nobody gets to send me their freight bills if I'm wrong. <laughs> okay. Okay. Send them to Bob. Yeah. Okay. What? So what we are seeing today is freight rates are... Uh, they have come off their absolute highs and we expect, we do not expect freight rates to be going up more through this year. Hmm. That's where we are right now. Even with the recent I, fuel, the very late breaking fuel increase price prices. Yeah, you know, I'm, I, I mean, there, there, there's sort of conflicting evidence right now. I mean, that the latest that I saw just before the call was, you know, that, uh, the, the oil market uh, may get uh, uh, a little bit softer based on some uh, government analysis that was just uh, released this yeah. afternoon. But uh, excluding, you know, the minute to minute movement of the diesel market, mm -hmm. um, as a general statement, okay, we do not expect greater demand shocks to occur this year. As a general statement, as the ports get healthy, right? That's going to relieve all this competition for a limited number of trucks and trains, okay? So the macro trends that we're seeing would point to not having um, a transportation shock occur in the immediate or maybe medium term future. That's, that's what we see right now. Yeah. Interesting. Last week on, with Ecom, of course, something else came up, which is uh, there's a CO2, there's a dry ice shortage now because of vaccine movement, Oliver. So, so listen, I, I want to uh, move us to a close. And I, as I want to do, I'm going to hit a few, I think, summary points. But before I do, uh, well, let me, let me say, iterate them and then ask you both if there's any other kind of closing uh, comments here, because um, Obviously, there's, we've covered a huge amount of ground, and it's impossible to summarize. But let me let me just say that the keys that I heard are, you know, supplies running 72 percent or so less than normal. There's obviously some categories frozen, and long uh, long um, lead time items that are worse. Uh, um, the main cause is is either not meeting manufacturing capacities or raw material shortages. So putting it more positively, this is an opportunity. If you've got solutions, UNFI needs and wants to hear from you. A uh, huge breakfast opportunity opening up as we see uh, uh, a whole lot of people who are not gonna be commuting for a long, long time. And so that's, you know, look, look if you're in that, if you have solutions for retailers in that space, um, value uh, packs are, are, you know, are you properly positioned? Um, uh, retailers really uh, can appreciate it. Many can appreciate it if you can get back, start to get back to promoting. Uh, they're needing some help and want, wants here. And uh, look for those red dots. And I'll guess I'll remind you that John's present. Th this will be posted. Um, it it takes uh, for the recording. It takes about a day to get it posted. But those slides will be up. And go look if you're a red dot. You know jump on it. I mean, UNFI is looking for suppliers who can alleviate service uh, deficiencies. Do uh, you guys have any other closing summary points, Bob? Well, you know, the only thing I'll say, referring back to uh, John's deck, is when, when John Race says the single most important key to success, that's something I would want to tune into. Yes. And the answer is uh, strategic temporary skew reductions. In other words, streamlining, thinking in terms of 80-20, you know, maybe uh, putting the long tail on pause uh, temporarily so that you can really uh, be in stock on your best selling and uh, items. Yes. Yeah. John, any closing comments from your end? I, you know, I just want to thank everyone for their time today. I, I hope that this provided uh, some value to you. And uh, we look, we really appreciate our suppliers and we're trying very hard in a difficult time. I know we're not perfect, um, 
but, but, but we are trying and we do want to help. And um, I think the more specific the question, the better it is to engage your supplier manager. If they don't have the answer, we'll, they'll get it for you. Yeah. Well, again, I want to thank both of you, uh, Bob, as ever, uh, for your insights. Uh, and John, you know, everybody here knows you're in the center of a, a storm. And so you're taking the time, you're making yourself available when people can't get other answers. It's just very much appreciated. And, and uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, when you said earlier, people don't have the option, people, people have the option whether to play or not. You don't have the option with me. I'm gonna keep having you come back. So uh, you just have been terrific and I really appreciate it. Uh, Carlene, if you could post the schedule I just want to remind folks, speaking of to John's very last comment, um, we will next week be hearing from two of John's major customer groups. Um, we'll be hearing from Infra and we'll be hearing from um, NCG uh, uh, with the uh, uh, leadership there. So a uh, chance to continue the story and I won't go into all the rest, but you can see we've got a wonderful range of um, other topics coming up in the coming week. So uh, stay tuned. I wanna again, thank New Hope uh, Network for uh, their participation with us. And of course, uh, also as ever, wanna thank Carlene uh, who makes this whole thing happen. Uh, let me just say again, if you have feedback, if you have uh, topics you'd like covered, uh, let us know. And again, here are the dates of the Entrepreneurship Institute. We will soon start registration. That also means We'll be soliciting cases. If you have uh, problems that you'd like discussed or, or uh, chewed over by our expert panelists, or if you want to pitch for capital, uh, we will have a full day uh, on the May 7th of uh, Pitch Fest. So uh, uh, stay tuned at hirschberginstitute.com for uh, those details. Again, um, thank you all for uh, a terrific day. John, Bob, uh, just superb. and, and uh, Good luck to us all and hang in there. Right. Thank you, everyone. Right, Talk bye -bye. to you soon. Bye. See you next week. Bye-bye.